Hello all, this is the Owl, and if this is releasing when I want it to, Happy Halloween! If not, I hope you had a good one. Anyway, a bit back, by which I mean pretty much right when I started this channel, I covered one of my all-time favourite horror manga, Fuan no Tane. This forms sort of my holy, uh, quadrilogy of horror manga, alongside Higurashi, The Rusted Scissors, and Gantz. Oh, and I should throw Made in Abyss on there too, so Pentology? Yeah, that's pretty metal. They're not necessarily the best horror manga of all time, well, except for Higurashi, Fight Me, but the ones that made me fall in love with the subgenre. However, way back then, well, my audio was crap my visuals were meh, and my script was really bad. Also, way too many loud jump scares. So, as with my Made in Abyss rework, which apparently some of you have really enjoyed, starting today, we'll be doing Fuan no Tane, and if there's any interest, its sequel slash sister series, Fuan no Tane Plus, in a bit more depth and hopefully just better. Oh, and has been so heavily requested, we will no longer be using the jump scare sound effects. Yes, yes, I know that for some of you this might be disappointing, but I swear, one in three comments on my PTSD radio series was folks kvetching about the jump scares. And yes, this is why none of you can have nice things. I will also be splitting this into two parts, one covering the first two volumes, and the second the final volume, which is longer than the previous ones, and also has quite a bit more to talk about. Once we are done, we'll be combining both halves into a single large video for ease of watching. And yes, we will be doing this from now on as time is increasingly tight, in regards to Baby Owl, as well as Mrs. Owl's studies, and yes, while I know some of you love those one hour long Made in Abyss videos, splitting things up a bit further is the only way I can see of not dropping to two videos a month. Babies, man. And with that, let's cap off Spooky Month with something genuinely scary. And if you're thinking that I'm talking out of my but, well, turn down the lights, turn up the volume, and get ready for something special. Fuan no Tane is penned by probably my second favorite horror manga of all time, Masaki Nakayama. He's quite something, believing wholeheartedly in the supernatural and creating several series on it, allegedly based off real events or anecdotes he heard. He's probably most well known, at least in the West, for PTSD radio, his unfinished magnum opus that allegedly resulted in him experiencing increasingly terrifying, likely supernatural events in his own life, leading him to end the series halfway through. I did a video on his account of this a few months back, you can go and watch it if you want a legitimately great campfire story of dubious veracity but plenty of entertainment. However, he also penned this manga, as well as a later pseudo-sequel Fuan no Tane Plus, and a third sequel 
for one no tane asterisk that I cannot find a copy of for love nor money right now to those of you who have asked. However, for one no tane is where it all began, and if anything, I think it's at least as good as his later stuff. It's not quite as polished, and it doesn't have much of a narrative through line, instead focusing on short, unrelated vignettes which range from the macabre, to the creepy, to the legitimately surreal. All of these are interspersed with photographs of places that Nakayama believed felt haunted or creepy, which often inspired the vignette that follows. Oh right, and before anyone mentions it, Fuan no Tane did get an absolutely craptacular film adaptation that is, sadly, worth avoiding even if you really like the manga. Now, as with previous Nakayama things, we won't be covering every single vignette here, as, with this being his first collection, they are of, shall we say, mixed quality. We'll just be looking at the really good ones, or failing that, at least the really interesting ones. If you want to read the entire thing, which I do recommend you do, and please buy this one if you can get it in your own language, go and check this one out. And yeah, sadly, there is no English release of this thing. And with its relative obscurity, our chances of ever getting one are perhaps as good as our chances of ever seeing that stupid skibbity toilet movie that people keep on trolling me on Discord about. And this means that, ugh, once again, we'll be going with a fanlation this time. Although, fortunately, this one isn't bad. And with that, let's dive on in. First up, Tension. This one involves a pair of schoolgirls staying late after class, when one tells the other to immediately hide under their desks. Something is walking up and down the corridor with really strange, heavy footsteps. Eventually, thinking that the mysterious stepper is gone, the pair prepare to leave, but when they open the door, yeah, I'm really going to miss those jump scare sound effects. And yes, this is a common trope in Nakayama manga. Huge, deformed faces looking in at you. It probably goes back to his childhood. This is followed by one of my favorites and another that, if I ever do finish my novel, will get a direct nod because it's so simple and yet so unconventionally terrifying. The rear guard's decision, with rear guard in this case, referring to a student who always stays super late at school. A middle schooler is preparing to leave the gym after wrapping up whatever he was doing there at night. And as he leaves, he sort of recounts a partial campfire story about the school. If you look at your reflection in a specific door after hours, you'll see something bad. Yeah, checks out to be honest. That is spooky. A huge distorted version of your own face, looking utterly terrified and insane. It reminds me a bit of, ah, uh, there was this Half-Life mod that got a full game. Completely bonkers, but really friggin creepy. And for the life of me, I cannot remember it. Anyway, Skipping over a few meh ones, the next good story is called The Stingy Buyer. A salaryman is working at home one night when a book that he bought from a second-hand store falls off the shelf. Apparently, this has been going on for a while, and it always opens to the last page where the previous owner, a young girl by the name of Michiko, wrote her name. A bit weirded out, he plans to put the book out with the garbage the next day, but then notices that he's not alone. Woof. And we learn the next day that the salaryman likely vanished 
and someone else dropped the book off at the lost and found. Yeah, this is why I like Nakayama so much. One of my big complaints about modern horror, particularly in the West, is how it tends to resort to info dumping and over explaining whatever creepy phenomenon is going on, resulting in it becoming demystified and almost mundane. It's why It Follows freaked my balls off, but most of the James Oneverse fails to make an impact with me. Peeping is up next, a pretty iconic one as far as Nakayama goes. This one has no dialogue, and we watch as a woman takes a bath, when she gets a strange feeling, stands up, and sees this, looking at her from the bathtub. And yes, there is an obvious joke here that I am not going to make. Our next story isn't quite as great, but it's such a perfect encapsulation of Nakayama's tropes that it really needs to be on here. Mr. Newt starts with a young man, one night, who sees something odd in a nearby building. He uses his telescope to take a closer look, after he realizes that it's someone somehow crawling on the outside of the building, and it turns out to be this nasty looking thing, that then comes and stares in his window at night instead. And this is very much along the lines of a lot of Japanese ghost stories, campfire stories, and superstitions, where the correct response is, if you see something that looks weird, it's just better to not engage with it, talk about it, or even look at it. As if you do, you risk attracting the attention of something you really don't want to. Quite a few of these stories are along these lines, and yeah, it's a big part of the Japanese mindset. Sometimes for the better, and sometimes for the worse. Anyway. Our next few stories aren't very scary and seem to be more comedic in nature, or just plain weird, like an old lady with a bad case of Southercore eye, and one fairly creepy one that I really like, called A Walk in the Cold. Once again with the message of don't draw attention to yourself in a weird place or at a weird time of day. And then we get a whole lot of rain-themed vignettes, which generally follow the pattern of someone seeing a bunch of weird crap in the rain. And this brings us to the bridge story, which is just odd and kind of sad. Message brings us a high school student who walks around talking to a teddy bear as if he was showing it all the local sights and what he does all day despite a lot of folks gossiping about him being some kind of weirdo. Somehow, this ties into his sister, who both has the same name as the teddy bear, Maya, and who I think is also implied to have some kind of serious illness. He then brings the bear home, where I guess it tells her all about the day, and that takes us to the end of volume one. Volume 2 is the weakest of the three volumes, but there are some good stories in it. The first good one is Tacit Agreement, involving a bunch of nurses working in the pediatric ward of a hospital, where they are haunted by a misshapen, blood-covered dwarf-like creature who they refuse to even discuss or acknowledge. And I'm guessing that this is some kind of social satire because, yeah, once again, this is very Japanese. The next few stories are kind of meh, and not especially interesting or scary. But then we get Hide and Seek. A pair of elementary schoolers are playing Hide and Seek, when a boy is grabbed by the hand by a girl, whose face we cannot see, yeah that doesn't bode well, and promised a fantastic hiding spot. He follows and, naturally, it doesn't end well. By the time he thinks to ask who the hell took him to a stinky old abandoned house, yeah. And we learn that indeed, 
he was never found. The next one on the list, Midair, is probably the best story in Volume 2. A man looking for a cheap place to live winds up going completely bonkers after moving into a house where there was a suicide. His brother, reluctantly, comes over to help him and finds something not very good at all on the ceiling. Yeah, dude, I'm not especially frightened of the supernatural, but this is where you go and stay at a motel if you're smart. That night, he wakes up hearing a strange creaking noise, opens his eyes and sees this. Yeah, I do miss those jump scare effects at a time like this because bloody hell, that is creepy. We then get a few more stories, nothing especially interesting or special, one involving a door with a horrible looking face on it, which is probably a prototype for a story that would appear later in PTSD radio, and one that seems to be a riff on the concept of Shinigami, no, not those, basically the Japanese equivalent of the Angel of Death catching people whose times have come and killing them instantly. The last one we'll take a look at from Volume 2 is pretty simple, but I don't know why. This one stayed with me, possibly because I spent a long and memorable portion of my life living in an absolutely gobsmackingly beautiful small town right on the northeast coastline of Japan in a house barely a minute's walk away from the sea, and I would often take a night smoke and stroll before I headed to bed. Anyway, a couple are walking along the shoreline and bickering when the girlfriend notices something weird. It appears that there's someone out there night surfing, only as they watch in horror, a bunch of huge, malformed heads begin washing up on the shore. Yeah, I have no idea what's going on there, but as with a lot of these, there is some X factor that just makes it freaky. There are a handful of other stories here, some better than others, and a few from Nakayama himself as he goes over a few of his own weird experiences growing up but nothing that comes close to the final why I can never finish this manga anecdote from PTSD Radio. Although, as I'll mention in a bit, the final story of Volume 3 comes close. But yeah, what a unique and honestly terrifying style the man has. And as he continues to create more stories, he really does get even better. Next time, well not next time next time, but the next time we do Fuan no Tane, we'll take a look at Volume 3, which is where the really good stuff is, including, as mentioned, another of Nakayama's own know this really happened to me things that I have to doubt a bit, but I still admire for a balls to the wall terrifying tale, but for that, you'll have to wait a bit. Before we finish for the day, I want to give a huge thanks, as always, to my fantastic patrons, Jake Reagan, Piece of Yeast, El Espresso, Cheerful Satanist, Starwin Marwin, Question Man 6, Kel Kor, Jacob Ramsey, Crazy, Opinion Custard, Wargle, Inukia Koji, Rose Montgomery, Lance Goebel, Paul Norberger, Rafferty, Aaron Arnold, The Hedgehog Gamer, Simone, XTC Pill, B Empress, Jake, Ranger Danger, and Cheshire Quill. If you want to see more like this, why not stick around? Subscribe, bell, you know the drill. If you want to hear me say your name, get early access to most of my videos, have some fun perks on the Discord, and, you know, help Mrs. Owl and I out, or buy Baby Owl a present, and ensure that I can keep on doing what I do, which I won't lie is a bit touch and go right now, why not take a look at our Patreon? If you want to chit chat about, well, basically anything, swing by our Discord, we truly do have a wonderful community over there. 
Take care, my friends, and cheers. This is the Owl, signing off.